the Old Testament reading that we heard a few moments ago uses a word that only comes up barely a handful of times in all of Scripture. Sentinel. Sentinel. One definition of this word is a guard whose job is to keep watch. With that in mind, a modern expression of a sentinel is a lifeguard on duty, keeping an eye out on the, all the people there, most if not all of whom are happily preoccupied with their own fun or their own business. But not you, you're on call, monitoring for behavior and warning signs. If you're on a beach in this setting, then you'll probably have another eye scanning the horizon now and again for oncoming storm or just a dorsal fin showing up now and then. Another modern sentinel might be a security guard at a live rock concert. Remember concerts? <laughs> the music was loud, people were singing or screaming along. Whether you liked the group or not, you weren't there for fun, you were there keeping watch. Gently but clearly pushing people back if they got a little too far to stage. Gently but clearly escorting people out of there if they made one too many poor decisions. In all their iterations across time, a sentinel keeps watch when others don't. And that gives them a particular responsibility. Not necessarily better or worse than the next person, but particular. Ezekiel found himself in that very role. Now, when we hear the name Ezekiel, or really any Old Testament prophet, there's a trap to just fall back into some broad brushstroke picture. Because there's always three parts to the story, right? You've got God, God's people, and God's prophet. God's people have gone astray, so God sends the prophet to try and get them back on track. Here endeth the cliff notes of Old Testament prophets. <laughs> have you heard this story before? <laughs> Be wary of that trap. There are details imbued in Ezekiel and all of the tales that beckon our attention. For example, we heard that Ezekiel was commissioned by God to warn God's people. If Ezekiel doesn't do this, the people's perished blood is on his hands. Okay? But if he does pass on this warning and the people just don't listen, then the perished blood is not on Ezekiel's hand. He can sleep peacefully that night while others struggle. Hang on a second. Isn't God supposed to always ceaselessly care for us? Can, can somebody tell God he's not following his part of the Cliff's Note story here? Place his people, come on. And yet here's God telling Ezekiel that he is in the clear if people don't listen. It's just a matter of if he carries out his sentinel duty. Had we started this passage just a few verses earlier, by the way, we would have heard similar instruction from God to a different sentinel over the same people. So this isn't just a one-off exception. God is repeatedly outlining this parameter. A professor named Mark Seafried identified this phenomenon as individual responsibility and corporate solidarity. Individual responsibility, so you, the person, taking ownership for your own actions or lack thereof, and corporate solidarity, a communal-focused way of living. You, a person, caring for others as much as you would care for yourself and they in kind. Two things that might sound incongruous, but can actually live in harmony. Some of you know I lived in South Africa for a little bit in my early 20s. I was a year-long missionary at a monastery in a rural area just outside of a town. Uh, this place had been alive and thriving years before I ever even had the idea to go over there. Uh, and what they did mainly was an education of ministry. For the middle and high school-aged youth of that rural area, the monastery yearly raised funds to cover their daily transport into town and their full tuition 
to one of the various middle and high schools in that town. This removed a huge barrier. For the elementary school students who couldn't quite get to town on their own each day, uh, what they eventually did was build a school on the monastery property, hired full staff, full certification, put all this together, there's a whole lot happening on a given weekday there. Sundays were always a treat as well. There was a giant Eucharist service. Many students and their parents would come, uh, would come back to the worship chapel at that time, a chance for people to gather and, and rejuvenate after a week of work. Such was the pattern for several years. But eventually the leaders, the monks and the other trustees started to notice something. Those middle and high school age students, the ones who were uh, going into town each day on a free ride. Most of them were wonderful. A few of them exhibited some poor behavior, academically and socially. For a while, the ministry tolerated this because in their mind, that was how they offered unconditional support. But what they soon noticed was that all this did, this tolerance, was giving these students permission to keep behaving poorly. And again, this is just an exception to the rule, but it was still there. It implicitly taught those students that their way of living was okay. The silence implicitly taught that the way of living was okay. Eventually, the leaders chatted with each other and they made a change. It was time to be a little less nice and a little more kind, less like a passive supporter, more like an active coach. Put another way, more like a sentinel. This does not mean it turned into some militant strict regime, but what it did mean was that students started to experience accountability. They weren't used to this at first, but before you knew it, the, over, the overall passing rate went up quite a bit. If a person's progress report had failing grades on it, they could expect to be talked to by one of the monks, to chat and to determine how to improve moving forward. Maybe just pull them aside after the Eucharist one of those Sundays, or go to their house now and again. Nothing inappropriate, but clear and coaching. There were two students in particular who had developed a fledgling interest in breaking the rules, going off doing their own thing, above and beyond what the parents and the ministry was okay with. One of them eventually righted his ship and got back on track. The other one didn't, and in due time, the decision was made to release him from that scholarship. He was still welcome at those Sunday services or any communal gathering, but as far as his educational path, he was on his own. Individual responsibility, corporate solidarity. Such is the way that that monastery found, uh, determined how to move forward, and such is the way of being a sentinel. This was eventually identified as a very caring and holy way that that ministry continued its education endeavors. From the perspective of someone else, the Sentinel's news is almost always uncomfortable. We were quite happy playing in the water, Mr. Lifeguard. Why'd you have to tell us that a shark is near? I was quite happy blowing off school, Mr. Principal. Why'd you have to tell me my grades were poor? Sometimes this can become even more acute depending on how personal it gets. I was quite happy enjoying that drink, Mr. Bartender. Why'd you have to tell me I've had too much? Correction from a prophet or any sort of sentinel figure often leads to greener pastures, but the way it does that is through reckoning with current unpleasantness. Which, by the way, is a glimpse of how Jesus shepherded and continues to shepherd over God's people. Not by ignoring issues, but by reckoning with them up front, leaving no stone unturned. Ezekiel was tasked with that sentinel job, and he, like us, had to trust that God's plan of reckoning was worth the hard, unpleasant work. Because keeping watch and speaking up is precisely how we can ceaselessly care for others.
had Ezekiel not accepted that mission, he would have been culpable. It would be like if you were assigned the task of being that active lifeguard, but you decided to turn into the lazy schmuck sitting next to him on the beach. Now and again, you might see what's happening in the waters, but you don't care. You're more focused on your book or your podcast or your distractor of choice. That's not a sentinel. A sentinel keeps watch and, through the Spirit of God, speaks up. Sometimes, silence can be blasphemy. This was a parameter of communal living in Ezekiel's time, and it's also a template of communal living today. Human beings frequently have blind spots when it comes to their own self-awareness. Christians are no exception to that. So sometimes we need others to help point out ways that we can improve or correct our own life of discipleship. If we see this in someone else, our task is to speak up, to approach it with grace. If others approach us with such a concern or conviction, our task is to listen with humility. Sure, maybe they're mistaken or wrong, but what if they're right? And if that's not enough, much like how one person can be a sentinel to another in our faith community, so is the church at large a sentinel for the wider world. We are in this world, yet not of this world, and that makes us a sentinel monitoring worldly behavior like a watch person, pointing out ways that the world can change and improve, frequently including ourselves in that observation, by the way. Are we open to hearing news from the Sentinel? You know, every four years, almost like clockwork, I'll have a friend or two who starts to share more news, whether it be sharing articles on a social media platform or just passing along gossip of some sort in casual conversations. Could be a report on the status of the world at large, the economy, coronavirus cases, stuff like that. It could be something that besmirches one specific individual or organization. This can sometimes lead to some very insightful dialogue, but now and again, there will come a time where we ask a question or two and we quickly figure out that this person didn't actually check to see if that claim was true. Maybe they just heard a piece of gossip through the grapevine and decided to carry it on as another mouthpiece. Maybe there was an article that had a catching headline, but they didn't bother to actually drill in and read it. I know I've been tempted by that now and again, and it's difficult to come to terms with this, but the reality is that sort of behavior is a textbook example of bearing false witness against a neighbor. You're sharing a story, a witness, that you don't know for sure is true. Can we try and remember that over the next few months, perhaps? Also, every four years, almost like clockwork, I'll start to hear the following phrase more often. The church should stay out of politics. That's not the church's job. Nobody panic. You're not about to hear an endorsement from me here. Here's what is the church's task, yours and mine. Remembering that our voting, much like all other public decisions that we make, is to come from a place of informed, God-inspired thinking. We're not able to leave our faith behind when we go to the ballot box, much like we are not called to leave our faith behind when we go to work or go to the next concert or do any aspect of our life. Instead, God calls us to tap into our faith, prayerfully discerning what God asks of us and letting that dictate our public hopes for our city, state, country, world because there is no corner of our worldly living that belongs outside the purview of our faith. Now for voting in particular, there's no single issue that'll monopolize this for us, but we can rest assured that it includes caring for the poor, sacrificially feeding the hungry, keeping watch at those boundaries, those borders of society, literal and figurative, and identifying ways that people need assistance. These are things God is trying to 
pass on to us as a message. Because ultimately, even those who don't change ways are still God's beloved. So our call in the world is to speak up, and even if people don't hear us or don't listen, we are still called to speak. If we don't do our part to help, we're in no better position than anyone else. God calls us to be the active lifeguard or the sentinel in the world, thus cultivating godly living in ourselves as much as others. Who's ready to watch? Who's ready to speak? Amen.